first meet in Munyana Mana? I would meet uh, in Munyana Mana, at Munyana Mana, probably in about 1981 or 82. So I was ordained in Wat Bhavan in 76 as a bhikkhu, 75 as a bhikkhu, seven years in Wat Plenty Pasana. And what happened was that some of my monk friends, uh, Jitupada, Vesudhachara, and Damadara, and also Japanese monk Chitananda, they had also been in one for one, and they had gone to Sri Lanka in the late 70s. In 1979, I was invited to participate in this Dharma seminar and pilgrimage to Sri Lanka. Uh, I met the other monks there in 1979 in Sri Lanka the Dharma discussions and I liked what I saw in Sri Lanka. I, we managed to visit uh, Nisamaniya at Mitrigana and we met Katukadinyananda and also the Abbot Martin, Martin Sri Lanka. So one could see a, a really beautiful forest monastery and I could see that the Sri Lankan monks staying in this Nisana they were very dedicated in the meditation, but also they were quite learned. So what attracted me was the combination of Sutta study with the meditation practice. So in 1980, uh, I arranged to actually go to spend the Vasa 1980 was in Sri Lanka, and we stood a child from Island Hermitage to uh, meet me in Colombo and took me down to Island Hermitage where Jita Pala was also staying. And also another new son of Sundra, we were all part of the same group who had faith in Kunsi Chin's teachings. And so we were at Island Hermitage. 1980. So, of course, I don't is the place where Bhante uh, Nyana Rinpoche was ordained many years before. Nyana Ramanthi was also at I don't at that time. Uh, he was a senior Western monk, almost 20 months, about 18 months at that time. And there was a German, another German monk, Gassenbach from Berlin, who was also staying there. He was more than 20 months. So I myself, it was 1988, I was my fifth master. I had permission from my Hopachaya, Sondi, and his son, Ron, the Abbot of to actually go to Sri Lanka. Then actually, uh, what happened at the, after the 1980 master at I went to the we got the opportunity to sit a chair, and myself got the opportunity to, to go to the ceremony. And that became the basis, the, uh, the, ba the, the, the base for my stay in Sri Lanka, the Forest Ministry, called the Seminary. When we used to go to Colombo, we used to stay at a large uh, study temple in Colombo called Wajirama. Now, Wajirama, the abbot at that time, still was from Narada. It's actually quite a beautiful place to stay. Ambala uh, Petya, the suburb of Wajirama, is still quite so commercialized. We still mainly just residential houses. It's very easy for people to to practice. And Wajirama was, we could say, like the seat of the Stamarakshi Nikaya, which was also the Nikaya that I don't know. So monks who ordained to the island village uh, would have ordained through Wajirama in Baba Bhavanapati Kalamba. And this is also the place where Bhantina Nimali used to come whenever he used to stay whenever he came to Kalamba. So during one of our visits to Kalamba, staying at Wajirama, I would have met Bhantina Nimali during that time. Of course, I had heard about Bhatti Nyanamima also from 
some of the more senior foreign monks living in uh, Sri Lanka, uh, even in Thailand, I actually heard of Satyanyana Vinaya uh, from Bhavanyana Wellington and also another senior Danish monk called Bhavanyana Deepa. So they had actually told me about Satyanyana uh, Vinaya. As a young foreign monk, 1980 was my was said. Uh, uh, Sri Lanka, where one had a lot of regard for uh, foreign monks, Western monks that were senior to myself, actually much more senior. So Sri Lanka was uh, actually the place we could, where we could still find this lineage of senior Western monks. But you know, Monica was still alive in Kandy. He, was, he must have been about 80 years old at that time. And this whole lineage of very senior Western monks in Sri Lanka. Uh, so, Antiyan Vimala was, I think, perhaps the most senior Western monk to Antiyan Pramika at that time in Sri Lanka. And he had quite a reputation to him. As a young Western monk, uh, we need senior senior monks to look up to, but especially senior Western monks. So, you know, young Vimala was, we would say, the, from a more practical practice aspect of the monk's life, was the senior monk that we looked up to. He lived a wandering life outside the Vassa. He lived a wandering life. Only during the Vassa did he actually find a suitable place to stay for three months of Wassa. Apart from that, he had the reputation of only staying three, three, three nights in any particular place. Obviously, as he was walking, well, then he would have perhaps stayed longer at places where he liked. I understand his one of the at Popitia Kama, which he liked to stay. I heard about Popitia Kama. But anyway, so Vinam Yama was this very austere Jairika wandering monk, uh, a German, and because of his lifestyle, with the different stories we've heard about Yama we were very impressed. He was like a good role model to look up to. Now, as I mentioned, one of the things that attracted me about Sri Lanka in terms of the monk's life was this combination of study and meditation practice. So, Vinod Yadavimana, from what we actually heard when we were at the island hermitage, etc., was Yadavimana had spent the, I think, the 10 years staying continuously at the island hermitage. I don't know if he actually left the island uh, during that time, or if he did leave the island only for very short visits. Vinod uh, Yadavimana was also fortunate to ordain and to have the company of Vinyana Horni and obviously some of the other very learned, inspiring monks from this Vatirama tradition, including Soma, who was a Tamil monk. Uh, Kaminda was a very close associate of Vinyana Vimana, someone that Vinyana uh, Vimana obviously looked up to. Kaminda was still alive, still very bright and healthy, staying with Jirana. So, Nyana uh, Vimala, when he spent his 10 years at the island heritage, he had the company of some of these very learned, uh, extremely sincere monks. Uh, we believe that after 10 years staying at the island heritage, then he had the island heritage and started his wandering career. And only occasionally going back to island heritage for visits. So I would have actually met Yana Vimala when he would have called into Vajirama during his walking tours. He struck one as being someone who was very self-contained. Uh, he had exceptional someone or restraint. He was uh, extremely serious. I mean to say that he didn't enter into 
possession easily or readily, readily with those around him. The way he walked and carried himself was very strange. He wasn't looking here and there. He had extremely few possessions because he's walking. He only had his bowl and a bag, a carry bag, which was it was not, obviously not pretty heavy at all. Just a tiny we would call it yarn, which had his basic requisites. So he's actually extremely light in terms of his requisites. And he would every day go into Baden, around uh, Bapada Pitya, the houses around Bachi uh, uh, There's one particular room where he tended to stay when he visited Bachi Lama's rather quite a large room where he stayed with a self contained toilet and bathroom. When he actually entered into the room, then he didn't see much of him. He tended to just stay inside his room. But every day he would come out uh, and he would have a uh, dumb discussion with you know, Kim Inter. Kim Inter was a senior, Sandy's monk, who was actually a friend of another uh, Sri Lankan monk called Soma. Soma, of course, has written uh, the book Way of Mindfulness. Etc. So sometimes, or well, often, we would see the uh, more young women having a double discussion of you know, in the, either inside Kimita's room or outside on, on the walkway outside the room itself. So, what, what, what struck one about the you know, young women was his composure. Uh, his very serious kind of uh, attitude to the monk's life, his very few possessions which he actually possessed, uh, how he tended to keep aloof from everyone else, uh, his not getting involved in conversations or talking to people unless there was uh, a reason for that. That's why actually we support what I actually notice. And also the reputation, uh, this wandering lifestyle that he had, obviously it was extremely difficult physically, uh, living on whatever arms he received. I think Philon Yan uh, had the reputation of being able to live with very few needs. Sometimes on his walking tours, he'd be walking on the east coast or in the north. I think he's, he's the only one who's walked around all of Sri Lanka a number of times. So some of the areas where he was walking, like the Muslim or Tamil areas, uh, it's quite likely that he, that he actually didn't get very much further to walk into that. Uh, but that was, that would be insignificant for the you know, young river. That would be just extra food for practice. Yeah, and when it was a, uh, uh, we could say, rhinoceros, it's a solitary. Uh, it's very hard to get close to the only army when I, I think even the 10 years that he spent in the island of Imitage, when the only army was still alive, the only army when he turned out by state himself from the other monks. But this is something that one can find out more from the like, only army to who was, would have been actually present during that time. But from what I understood, the Nonyaru Vimala had, you know, there's kind of this very kind of conservative attitude towards him. Uh, I was coming from a later generation, uh, my particular generation was more open minded, we could say, a little bit on the heavy side. But the Nonyaru Vimala was very kind of conservative. And from my understanding, I think the Nonyaru Vimala, when he was at Island Hermitage, would have keep himself apart from the more kind of hippie-ish kind of uh, personality that came to Ireland and the more kind of open to the raw uh, truth seeker who would have come to Ireland and the There must have been many of them at that time. But the other young women was, from my point of view, seemed to be very conservative, what we would once have called very straight, yeah. kind of narrow sort of uh, personality. And also this kind of severity to him and the wish, actually, we can't, I don't think we could say, that's the word, um, 
little bit exclusive, not wanting to waste his time, not wanting to be frivolous, mm. not wanting to get involved in what would be meaningless uh, talk for him. Mm. So that's why he would have kept himself apart. This is part of this somewhere, part of the restraint. Uh, and someone said to me, uh, what you are now, perhaps it was due to the pilot, was, uh, was, you know, you just saw a young woman, he was so self-contained. He didn't need anyone outside him, just so self-contained. So, it's like he just didn't need to talk to others. Mm. And uh, this made him a little bit, how do you say, uh, unapproachable. You had to be mm. aloof, a little aloof, but also you, you felt you had to be a little bit careful when you mm. approached him. I won't say about freeliness, but there was something about which made you to be a little bit careful in terms of your even wanting to go to see him. So there's the other point you get, the other sector, and then the other you know, must be the next in terms of seniority, this and So we had certain of the very, very senior monks of the senior monks, then on the other you know, stood out as being very strict in terms of his family practice, very ascetic, one who a vegetal, this fumes of wishes, very restrained in every way. So in his walking lifestyle, this uh, austere, of course, not for austerity, so that was a very good role model for us. But as I was from this little conversation I had, I found that all young women are a bit rigid in his views. I'm always taking it as a person that uh, wasn't so much a dollar discussion as more well, without being taught by him, mm -hmm. according to certain suitors which he thought was important for younger monks to train themselves by. Pinon Yana Vimana, from my understanding, belonged to a school of monks. Thinking about Pedro Kenita especially, who believed that jhana was necessary for progress in meditation. They did not actually agree with the Munyana Panika, who was more, more supportive or more understanding that one could actually develop a vipassana like the Mahasi system. So, Pinonyana Vimala actually tended to associate that with Vinokinita, had very strong views that child was necessary for development before one could attain. However, from what knowledge I actually have of Pinonyana Vimala's actual practice itself, what he actually uh, imparted to some of his similes, among the disciples, it seems that Pinonyana Vimala's main practice from my understanding was actually one based mainly on mindfulness and awareness of the six doorways. Of course, we can imagine when you're spending so much time walking and on Charaka, it wouldn't be possible to actually practice a deep sight meditation. So I think actual, actually the other women, we have to actually verify this from the actual interviews with his close uh, disciples, among disciples, but it seemed to me that the emphasis was on mindfulness, this mindfulness was everything. So no matter what activity you participated uh, during the day as a monk, always to keep your mind uh, on a kamatana, on a meditation practice, and also the emphasis on the six six uh, doorways things of the mind arise to get upon the six doorways. At Vajinama, uh, if I was at Vajinama and Vajinyana Vimana was present, of course one uh, tried to arrange to meet him. Then when young women always took the position of being a teacher. So it was never it was never the situation of a Dhamma discussion. So then when young women would be sitting in the chair and one would sit on the floor, of course. There's always that uh, difference, of course, there's a big difference in what's in seniority. 
uh, and venerable Yanni Mala had certain suitors from Majinika which he liked very much, which he thought that younger monks should actually study and should train in. Uh, another thing was the, the story of um, about how free Vajinara Yuri could actually live. So once I was uh, at Vajinara and this very eminent lay Dhamma teacher at a Kwabasan actually visited uh, Vajinara as he often used to. And he was talking to the other monks, Singhis monks there, I was also present. And Alec Robinson was talking about how he had met uh, sometime previously, I don't think it was that particular day, maybe a few days previously. He had, Alec Robinson was coming into the monastery and was meeting Matthew and the other people who were sitting out from the monastery. So they actually were inside the but he had never was going to walk out of the monastery and at once so this very eminent other lay down and preacher was entering. So Alan Watson actually asked Bhante Yamani Mala, Bhante, are you leaving? So I'm like, are you leaving today? And Bhante Yamani Mala said, yes, I'm leaving. So then uh, Alan Watson asked Bhante Yamani Mala, Bhante, where are you going to go? So Bhante Yamani Mala said, I decided to go to the gate. And it's really quite remarkable was this attitude. Perhaps Bhante Yamani Mala had some idea, but he really hadn't made a decision until he got to the gate of the monastery where he was going to turn left or right. He would walk in the morning, which included the Bintabad, taking the Bintabad, and then sometime in the early afternoon, if he found a suitable place to stay, he would stay, like in the Pansa. So he would walk maybe only 10 kilometers a day. I think he didn't have a walk, but when he actually got to the Pansa, you know, there's a tradition in Sri Lanka with like the village temples that visiting monks can stay three days. It's just like a separate custom. But many of the village temples, maybe we would not really like to stay anymore, but we must remember that young people was walking in the 60s and 70s and 80s. I think the temples have perhaps got a lot more worldly than what they were at that time. Even what you know, back in uh, the early 80s, in the 80s was still a very pleasant place to stay. Was more, even though it was right in the city, it was like being you know, in, in like a park. But just because of development, uh, all that area got developed and the Gore Road, for instance, just so many cars and vehicles and everything sort of changed there. The atmosphere was really good change. So I think the time when Yara River was doing this walking was uh, a time when the pastors were a lot more peaceful. But coming back to his, his personality and his character, so I understand many of the young people have been to the past that got permission to stay and a room was given to them. They basically went inside the room, closed the door, that was it. And uh, I don't know if he would have even received uh, like a sweet tea from the from the from the answer because he would have been concerned about Vinaya also. He is extremely austere. This is the kind of severity that he had about his personality. Uh, Antinya Rimla could speak singer, but his thick German accent perhaps uh, made his singer actually not easy to understand. So Mithvihara was telling me about when Mithvihara was to a lame person, so they met he and his wife. In, uh, invited you know, young people to their home and it the highest mother was was there. So the only other women I gave actually like a like a little bit of a discourse uh, in the house in similes that when the highest mother law couldn't understand mm -hmm. because the single was also fairly basic but also just the pronunciation was very difficult to understand. So I, I, from my understanding, 
because the young women didn't like to get involved in conversations that were that frivolous conversations. I think his knowledge of sin was very basic. But in young women, it could turn up anywhere. So I remember years later when I was staying up in Kandy, I would go to uh, Dr. Nihal Karuratna, who had the People's Dispensary in in uh, Kandy on the main road. She trained her dear son in Okinawa to the end. And uh, Dr. Nihal just told me how Martin Yanguna would just, when he was just coming to Kandy, would just come to the uh, doctor's dispensary. And then, of course, that was the opportunity for them to provide data for him. So, just talk about him and young women, he's like an inspiring example to us uh, because of this very serious outlook uh, in terms of the dark practice, uh, his restraint, uh, there's a kind of a severity to him. Uh, but as I mentioned, as young ones, we needed to have good examples. We heard various kinds of stories, like for instance the fact that he walked through Yala National Park from uh, from would be from Tisamahavalu right through to uh Pamela and Hotel on the other side. We heard that he stayed at Kutumikara Avani when the when Kutumikara was looked after by the Pazakuma train plus again. There's a story about how the you Nyan know, women was sitting in a cave in Kutumikala Avanyan, which was actually just completely deserted, just this ancient cave on the street where Mantra Pasika was staying and providing support for any monks who should come here. So we knew the story of the you know, women staying in a cave and how the bear actually came into the cave while the you know, Nyan women was sitting in meditation, but the bear actually didn't do anything once the bear noticed that one young woman was there and turned around and went outside. There's one story I heard where a young woman was on the east coast on his walking tour. He's staying at a small water uh, meditation at Forest Monastery and he was staying in the Sema when the Pantin Yan Vibra was away from the Sema. Uh, the abbot of that monastery actually had a look at all the other women's possessions. <laughs> and uh, what the abbot found was, you know, there's actually nothing there which a thief would like to steal. I think, I think later, uh, Chitapada actually went to this Arani uh, on the East Coast and the abbot actually told. I think that's how I actually read this story, that everything that the young woman was uh, actually his possessions, so like he had like a knife which was broken. It was usable, but it was not something which uh, people, people would like to steal. So his requisites were old or used, and they could, they could be used practically, but the broken or something like that, so uh, people don't like to actually steal them. That's one thing I can remember about the other you know, people. Now, a little uh, example of this, when I actually went to Ireland Hermitage first, it could have been 1980 or 1981, when I was visiting, there was actually a very beautiful, beautifully carved face of a lion roaring wood carving with the clock in the center of the jaw of the lion. It's actually really skillfully carved. By Nyana Seer. By Nyana Seer. Nyana Seer was this uh, uh, German summer who ordained an old time and we knew that Martin Nyana really did not approve of how Nyana Seer was living his life as a summer here. And obviously, sometimes they must have met. And anyway, Colonel Yanisia was also a painter and also an artist. 
Okay, so he had actually carved this really beautiful carving of the lion with his fangs roaring with a clock in the center. And the unseer was actually present and he said, who is this? And of course the young ones who didn't know. So the unseer said, this is the only one roaring with this like a very, like the lion. Uh, and uh, because Pirinyanamimala was going to be, I think, uh, was expected to visit Ayurveda village sometime in the near future. Then that crop disappeared, the car disappeared, I never ever saw it again. But that was, uh, you know, see, his own kind of way that he could, through the artist, artist's streak that he had, he could, dis- he could uh, display uh, his feelings or his way that he saw the and I stayed in New Zealand uh, until the end of 84. I couldn't take it anymore, so I decided to leave to come back to Asia. I was, so I went back to Thailand on my way to, to go back to Sri Lanka, but then I heard that my mother had been diagnosed and had terminal cancer. So I decided to go back to New Zealand for the 85 Wasa also. I wasn't sure how long my mother had to live. The Suryan, Suryan, my mother lived for one and a half years. Uh, she was not expected to live so long. But she died towards the end of 86. And during that time, I was able to spend the weekends with my parents and the, the week, and actually the Buddhist week, how I wanted. It was actually a difficult experience for me being a Buddhist monk in New Zealand. In 1984, I said, uh, Jeremiah and Bruce Monk in New Zealand at that time. And I managed to keep good veneer. I made a few concessions to veneer when I was with my parents staying at their house. But such things as using money, evening money, I was able to avoid that. So my three months in New Zealand was spent there, uh, living close to my parents, going to spend weekends with my parents. But it wasn't an easy time for me, and I would have much preferred to be back in Sri Lanka, uh, carrying on with my practice. So after my mother died, uh, then I decided this time that I must go back to <coughs> my practice, even though my father asked me to stay on, uh, considering his old age and his illness, I decided to to leave my father and to go back to Sri Lanka. So when I actually arrived in Sri Lanka, uh, and I of course went to Wajimama, we were all able to stay in Colombo, uh, but in the other was actually resident in Wajimama. So after going from Bintabata and a suitable time, having eaten, etc., I went to see Bhante Nyana Mimana. It was just like it was an opportunity when we could go to see Bhante Nyana Mimana. We, uh, we used to take that opportunity, so I went to see them and uh, I explained to Bhante Nyana Mimana how the last three years I've been away from Sri Lanka, living in New Zealand, how I looked after my parents, things like that. And I also said that I was able to keep most of the months precepts during that time. And he gave me a bit of a double talk. I brought this question up about how I was on Bindabada and I saw this old lady and how this wish arose in my mind to get a little bit of Bindabada food to this old lady. And I just mentioned this to my young woman. And so her attitude changed. She became very kind of stern. And he spoke to me in a very kind of hard way. And so Bhante Yarimina said, uh, you just went back to the West just to indulge your senses, just to enjoy yourself. He said, someone there is like you, which is very like a dagger, someone there is like you, you shouldn't go to the bar. You should just keep your mind on your meditation object and go and take your food, take meals and the dana sign here and watch your mama. Some years like you should just go and take your food and go 
it's simply it's just, just for me it's just like being uh, it's, it's just so severe and so insensitive I didn't even think it was said that's enough now that's enough you can go so I paid respect and I left and uh, I found that you know this is uh, a monk who I had thought very highly of but this as a role model something to inspire them for one's monks life. And I still saw him as being a very wonderful monk, very sincere in his practice, but what it showed to me was his incredible insensitivity that he could have this sort of ego, but he you know, was being very kind of narrow in some ways, being very kind of conservative. His mind was, we could say, set in certain ways. And one thing that his mind was set about, he couldn't understand how anyone could actually go back to the place in the way he was actually would have been in the early 90s was the Vajir Rama and Bhakti uh, Pedasi uh, came by vehicle from Ramakura and Bhakti uh, Pedasi told us that he had, they had actually met Munyanimala in Ramakura, I think it was, at the temple there and Munyanimala uh, was heading off uh, for Colombo he was actually unwell. He was having difficulty even walking. And Bhante Piyadasi actually uh, offered uh, to offered to take the uh, by car to come but the Vimanyamila refused and walked. So did he ever go by car? We, I don't know about that, but anyway, we were expecting to expecting him to come because walking whereas he does your red come to in a few hours. But then we heard when we were watching other he had actually walked to the hospital to the Vihara in the hospital where there's a, actually a long from watching other had this Vihara in the Kona hospital. So uh, we had to actually walk there. And when he got to the hospital he was in a in a extremely sick condition. I think he could have even been put in the intensive care unit. He was so sick with just complete fatigue, weakness, exhaustion. exhaustion, and also he began to have extreme difficulty with his hips. He basically wore out his hips from walking. Wow. And this would have been perhaps in the early 90s. Then, just a couple of years later, we met him. Uh, it could be out of this time, maybe. But he had been going to wait for another trip walking out at that time, but he couldn't walk for much longer. Okay, so the time that I was staying in Wachirama in, must have been in the mid 90s, and Midway I was looking after Granya Riva, and there was a complete character change. A oh. complete character change. Mm -hmm. Now, but he, yeah, he was so sick, he was just like a, a bag of skin and bones. Oh. And the food that he could take was minimal, things like marmite and things like that. Um, more like liquid foods. More like liquid, yes, really. Just a bag of bones, there's no word for it. And he was so sick, I think that everyone thought that he was going to die. And since so still in the 90s? In the 90s. Yeah, I think he would come from that anyway. So a little bit of hurry used to help him walk up like one length of the room, one, one length or up and down. And he had to be fully supported, always carried, just that little bit of exercise was all he could accomplish, just one length of the room. Uh, he was lying in bed, even to turn over in bed, he had to be assisted to turn over. Really, he was just so weak. And Medley Harris, very wonderful, the key that Medley Harris gave him during that time. And I was also present to uh, help him a little bit whenever when I could. The other woman's character had completely changed, he was helpless. Mm -hmm. So he was this person who was a very kind of uh, bright mind and actually shown a lot of love. 
this is very different from the young women that I saw 